Well, William, welcome to the L3 Leadership Podcast. Really looking forward to the conversation and excited about everything that you're doing. Oh, thanks, Doug. I appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, well, you wrote a brand new book, and uh, it, it's called Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits that Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. And I'm certainly going to dive into that. But before we do, can you give people a little bit of context about who you are and what you do that made you actually write this book? Yeah, so I, uh, I'm i a, a f- long time ago, I was a pastor, okay? Went into the business world. I'll give you the short version. And when I was in the business world working for a very large oil and gas company, the uh, CEO said, I've been here nine and a half years, time to get my successor. And they hired this thing called a search firm, which I'd never heard of. So back in my days of being a pastor, I was a senior pastor most of the time. And uh, I, I was the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Houston, which is an amazing church, wonderful people, great city amazing history. Sam Houston went to church there. I mean, it's pretty cool. Uh, they took three years to find me. Ooh, wow. I was there six years. They took three years to find the next person. <laughs> okay. And that's, Pat. that was all viewed as like just the way the world is. And this oil and gas company hires this search firm, which I'd never, you know, even thought about as a company. And 90 days later, they had their next CEO. And I was like, you know, I wonder if we could build something. The original question was, could we build something to help churches find their pastors quicker and more thoroughly? Right. Um, It's since spread. I mean, that was 15, 16 years ago. Um, And now we, you know, faith-based schools, faith-based nonprofits, rescue missions, and even faith-based for-profits like the Chick-fil-A's of the world or the Dave Ramsey's hire us. So it's, it's pretty much anybody who is in a, uh, a Christian based organization that needs top talent. And we've been privileged to complete over 3000 searches for those folks. Wow. Um, wow. That's led to countless phone interviews, zoom interviews. Um, it's, it's also led to, uh, face-to-face interviews with finalists for a job. And we've now done 30,000 of those. Wow. So, yeah. So, we, so then this thing happened called the pandemic. Um, I can't, yeah, I can't imagine what it's like running a rescue mission during a pandemic, but uh, <laughs> it was a journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nearly every one of our clients were shut down indefinitely for the pandemic. Right. Mm. Uh, which frees up your calendar, I guess is a positive way of saying it, but, uh, <laughs> had to figure out our business in the middle of that. And, and while we were, um, in the lockdown and had some spare time, we started studying those 30,000 interviews. We said, do they have anything in common? Hmm. And this was just going to be like a really selfish study because, because I wanted to answer this question. How can we learn to spot true talent quicker? Hmm. If I can do that, then I do a better job for our clients. Churches find their pastor quicker. Everything goes better. Right? So how can I just identify? You, you've probably met one of these people. They're, they're within five minutes. You're like winner. Yeah, I can tell. And and it doesn't happen very often. But but could you find a systematic way to identify those people that make us a better search firm? So we studied these thirty thousand. Do these people have anything in common? And the answer was uh, very very clear. The answer was yes. And it was not at all what I thought it'd be. And mm. and it moved us from selfish research project book. I I thought, uh, Doug, that it'd be like, well, they're all six feet tall. He's top (laughs) performer. You know, I mean, hey, you want to go biblical? Saul was head and shoulders above the rest (laughs) of everybody. I mean, literally was taller. Like, maybe it's that. Maybe it's uh, uh, they're good looking. And, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe maybe it's as simple as he was the quarterback. She was the head cheerleader. Like, Hmm. What do they have in common? And the research didn't show me any of that because those are all things you're kind of born with or born into. Um, what we found was there were 12 habits that the best of the best, we call them the unicorns, all seem to share. And their habits, they're the way they behave, not how they look, not what education they receive, not what level of money, certainly not ethnicity or gender. 12 habits 
that really centered around how well they treated other human beings mm, and, and wow. intentionally. And so you uncover this stuff and I, I forget who it is. I've got a philosophy minor, which is not super helpful as a businessman, but <laughs> I remember, um, I think it was Aristotle that said the greatest part of instruction is being reminded of the things you already know. Mm. So, uh, the, these 12 habits, like you read the 12 habits on a, a table of contents and you know, you probably look at me and say, duh, William, I could have done that list. That's simple. You know, I, I, I kid people, we had to kind of cajole the publisher into putting unicorn in the title because they didn't like that word for a while. They like <laughs> it now. But uh, the, the alternate title was just, huh, I guess mom was right. Because the list mm. is like <laughs> lessons that, you know, my mother tried to drill into me. And, you know, I guess it would be a simplistic book if it were William's musings on his opinions about what makes top people, top people. Hmm. But that's not what this is. This is 30,000 data points of top performers, and they all seem to gravitate toward these 12 habits. And they're simple habits that nearly everyone else does not practice. Hmm. And, and so it's, now we've got a roadmap. So when we had, when we uncovered this these twelve habits, it's like these aren't traits; these aren't um, they're habits. They're things people choose to do. And when we realized these aren't just now, it's not just I can identify that you're great talent. I can actually teach you to become great talent hmm. if you will wow. follow this roadmap. And that's when we're like, okay. That was cute to think it'd help us be a better search firm, but now we got a roadmap that could help a lot of people learn how to stand out, whether they're working at a rescue mission, whether they're a high school senior applying to college, whether they're trying to hire people for their own team. So uh, we, we kind of stumbled across a, a pretty cool learning that we wanted to share with a lot of people. Yeah. And, and I love that this is data driven and I love how you said, you know, it was nothing like you thought it would be. Um, yes. And why I think this is important for leaders, you know, you mentioned sometimes we just meet people and it's like, yep, they got it. They're home run. Like I know it. Uh, but other times it's easy for us to overlook someone because they may not look like what we think as a unicorn. And uh, in researching you, I, I, you actually uh, share a funny story with Chris Hodges, who pastors one of the largest churches in America. Can you share that story and, and how insightful that can be for leaders so we don't overlook unicorns as well? Yeah. Yeah. I'm supposed to be the expert on spotting talent. And <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, well, a long time ago, there it is. I was, yeah. at, a, I was at a fundraiser uh, for leadership development in the, in the two thirds world and a John Maxwell event. And John has been a good friend for a long time. And he said, William, come here, come here. I want you to meet my friend. Uh, okay. And so this is Chris. He's getting ready to plant a church in Birmingham. Now I had pastored in Montgomery, Alabama before Houston. So I knew a little bit about Alabama. And I looked at him and he, you know, very unassuming, humble looking guy, uh, not six feet tall, you know, not <laughs> all those things that uh, you would think would be what make the best the best. And, and I just said to him, Chris, uh, that's great, man. You're going to plant in Alabama? He said, yeah. I said, have you ever lived in Alabama? He said, nope. <laughs> I said, uh, have you got, you know, like family in Alabama? He said, nope. And uh, do you have any friends at all in Alabama? He said, nope, not one. And just smiled at me. And I just looked at him and I said, well, good luck, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's how smart William is. Not but nice. but I think it's beautiful. I mean, that's what ultimately why this book is so important. Because I think, you know, I can speak for myself and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone listening as leaders. We've all done that. We've all interviewed someone who we thought this person isn't it. And then we see them go to another organization and they thrive and excel. And it's like, ah, I missed them. So yeah, frustrating. I think, and so I think my more common miss, I'm hopelessly extroverted. <laughs> and so Same. when I meet someone that I really enjoy talking to, like there's a, there's an energy or something. I, I used to mistake that as a sign that I should hire them. And that's not, mm. at all. <laughs> that's not what spotting a unicorn is. It's not, do I like them or not? Now, likability is one of the 12 habits. How do I 
get people to like me and how, how do I do things for others? But it's not the be all end all. And I think my more common miss is hiring somebody that I genuinely like being around and then finding out that they're no good at the job. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's so good. Yeah. So people, leaders need to read this book. Uh, I wasn't going to cover it, but you mentioned likability and I would love to cover all 12, but obviously we don't have time. Um, I would love for you to share about why likability is so important. And I heard you share a life hack uh, as I was researching you about Bill Clinton, specifically about looking people in the eye, the importance of that. Can you talk about likability and why that's such a, a critical factor in being a unicorn? Yeah, well, you know, likability, a, a lot, these, are, these 12 habits are distilled. They're also deeply intertwined. Hmm. Okay, so, so if, authenticity is one of the habits, the authentic. The likable and the authentic really go together. I, you know, um, I think the more authentic you are, the more likable you become. And that means you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be you. Right. Wow. But, but the real secret to likability that, I mean, I would, there's just some people I pull for and I don't know why I pull for them. Like, it's amazing. Likeability is such an interesting thing. You watch a, you know, a bad TV program where the, you end up pulling for a criminal because they've somehow made the thing like, why am I pulling for the bad guy? Because <laughs> they're just so darn likable. But, you know, as one who has never been called, oh, William is just so likable. I've been fascinated with how I can do better at this. And, and one lesson I learned is people really like being seen hmm. and recognized and noticed. I mean, you see it in a rescue mission all the time. You know, homeless people feel unseen. No one yep. will look them in the eye. They love it when people actually, you don't have to hand out money, but people love, just recognize me. Okay. So I learned this um, early on from a lot of leaders, the, the leaders that I got to be around and, and the places I served had a whole lot of leaders. Uh, the best leaders I knew, I could not get them to talk about themselves. Hmm. Wow. They were always deflecting the conversation back to me. And I had this happen with uh, President Clinton. We ended up doing a funeral together and there was a big rainstorm. So instead of having time outdoors with all his friends from Washington, he ended up holed up in my office with me for a few hours. It was hmm. weird. Wow. Um, but uh, what a lesson. I mean, he he said, Doug, he said to me, you know, I'm trying to talk to him about him, get him to talk about himself. And you assume politicians are a little egotistical. Want it. Nope. He didn't want to do that. And so I'm trying to talk to him about him and he looks over on my desk and he sees a brochure where I'm leading a trip in Greece for the, for the footsteps of Paul and the early church and all that. Oh, you're going over there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. President. Well, you ought to look up my friend. I don't even remember the title, but basically it's the Pope of the Eastern Orthodox church, like the patriarch wow. or whatever the, you know, the thing is. I'm like, well, and this was, this was, uh, 2006. So think about your technology in 2006. I said, well, Mr. President, I will just get on one of those search engines and look up his phone number and I'll, I'll call him. He said, no, 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 no. I'll take care of it. And then, so I'm trying to, okay, now we're talking about you. You got a yarn bracelet on where'd that come from? That's kind of interesting. Oh, it's these children in Bolivia that we are, you know, I met and they make them and they sell them to try and build a, you know, economic platform kind of thing. And I said, that's fascinating. We do some mission work down near there. And he said, well, you need to know the ambassador to Bolivia. I'm like, well, I'll just get on one of those search engines and I'll just look. And he said, no, 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 I'll take it. And this went on and on and on. And not even a week after the funeral, I got a, a he sent me a copy of his autobiography inscribed to me with a lovely note about the funeral. Hmm. And then of course the call came from whatever the dude's title is in Greece, you know, and the ambassador, like he totally followed through. He was interested wow. in me. He saw me and he then followed through when he didn't have to. And hmm. like, we don't vote the same way on a lot of things, but man, I get it. I wow. totally understand why he, he won. And, and, and the other thing that I've noticed, and this is, this is me, but I noticed it from him. I noticed it from a lot of other leaders that you talk to. Um, they look me in the eye. Hmm. It, it kind of back to the homelessness issue. Like 
I've just heard you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but like, that's a big deal, right? People no, don't huge. look in the yeah. eye. Here's a life hack for you. If you want to be more likable, okay, look people directly in one eye. You can't look two places at once. And if you stare at somebody here, they're not, they don't feel seen at all. Here's a fact, human biological fact. 90% of all humans are right eye dominant. Wow. So that's a pretty safe bet. 90% chance you're right. Look them dead in their right eye. Nowhere else, not the left eye. They, you, you, your dominant eye is where you see things. Your non-dominant is where peripheral comes in. So look them dead in their right eye. I promise you, if you do that, you'll be more likable hmm. because people really want to be seen. Yeah. So this is so powerful. And I want to talk about another one of the the habits. You, you talked about Bill Clinton's ability to follow up and he responded to you, uh, to your conversation. The other one that it seems like it's resonating or at least challenging leaders the most is fast. And this yeah. whole idea of responsiveness. And I know for me, I mean, that, that challenged me the most out of the 12 habits. And, you know, I've been in fundraising for forever. Um, can you talk a little bit about fast and why this is such a critical habit for, for leaders? Yeah. Well, so, so it's the first habit in the book, maybe because it's my favorite, maybe <laughs> because it's the easiest one to pick up. Mm. It does not require a lot of studying. It doesn't require talent. It doesn't it just get back to people quickly with an intentional human response, not an AI chatbot response, not the five or six options you get on your iPhone lock screen when you don't want to answer the phone. God, sorry, I can't talk right now. No, not that. Get back to people quickly with an intentional human response and you will stand out in the crowd. Mm -hmm. That does not happen anymore. I, and I can, I can go through, well, fundraising. I was just reading some research on fundraising, right? For pastors at churches, this was a study. How do you convert a first time donor into a, a regular donor? Right? This is the question. Okay. Um, this study that I was reading showed that the single most single most effective thing you can do as the pastor to convert a first time donor into a long time donor is to text them on the day of their very first gift. Hmm. Wow. Hey, Doug, I saw you were in church today. I saw you made a gift to us. Our records show it's the first time you've made a gift to us. I just want to thank you for believing in us and trusting us. And all, all done regular wow. donor. And people don't do that. They hmm. don't get back to people. I mean, people who are on dating websites take forever to get back to prospects. <laughs> and that's like, you're lonely. You're on the website. You should be <laughs> getting back to people. It's so, uh, I think, you know, particularly if it can be an intentional response, this is going to be gold because up until now we've not had auto responses. Now the auto responses we're getting are all written by AI. They're not, they're not human at all. So if you can just drop back just a little bit and say, you know, I'm glad Tomlin's staying one extra year. That's good. You know, for a Steelers fan. Out there. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge Tomlin fan. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I just think in the middle of all the AI noise that's about to happen and in the middle of a reality where people really don't get back to one another quickly, this is the easiest habit to pick up and, and change the way you uh, make an impression in a crowd. Yeah. And I'll be a little bit vulnerable here because my understanding is you're maniacal about this personally, you, and, uh, and you're good at it. Um, I'm curious, I guess I'll throw a few things out there and just see what sticks for you to respond to. But one, you know, you work with executives. I'm assuming a lot of them have executive assistants, uh, do their email. What is, what's your thought on having them respond versus that? And, and just how do you keep up as a leader with that? You know, leaders are in meetings all the time. You know, for me, I have four young yeah. kids under seven. Mm -hmm. I get bombarded in email and text and, and social. And I, my heart, I'm a people person. Like I love relationships. I want to stay up to date with everyone, but it is so hard for me to keep up with the demand. And, and I look at leaders, I know leaders like yourself, and I see them respond in seconds. I'm just like, how, I don't know if you have any advice for people like me. I yeah. want to get better at this, but I'd love to hear it. Uh, I'm learning as I go. And I think it's, um, when I was first thinking about doing search, I had a guy from a big, big firm, biggest search firm in the world, Corn Ferry. 
uh, tell me I should try it out. And he was just the best in the world at energy. He, he can mm -hmm. find CEOs for energy companies. Like he's the guy. And I'm like, Bruce, how in the world do you know if I'm going to be any good at this? I, I just heard about this industry. And he said, now this is, uh, 2008. So the iPhone was not yet born. Okay. So keep that locked. There was a time long time ago when there were no iPhones <laughs> and this, this was then and I said, Bruce, how do you know if I'll be any good? He said, okay, so let's imagine that you save up your money and you get to take your daughter on a one-on-one -on -one ski trip, lifetime memory. You're on the ski lift with her talking to her and your phone rings. What do you do? Hmm. And I said, well, it depends on who it is. Hmm. And he said, you're going to be fine. Wow. I said, why? He said, first of all, you had your phone. There was a time when you didn't carry your phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. You know, secondly, you took the time to see who it was and make your decision based on that. And it may take you a while to fine tune it, but just, yeah. And that's a pretty good lens to throw things through. When people reach out to you, imagine yourself on that ski lift with a daughter. Would you respond or not? Hmm. And, really and sometimes you have to. I remember as a I mean, we were just getting going and I was like the sales, the cook, the bottle washer, the whole, all the things. <laughs> and we'd saved up all our points and took uh, the kids to Disney. And we're get, like getting on the Dumbo ride oh, man. Right? after waiting forever. And an email came in from a really important now client that wasn't a client at the time. And I, I'm answering it. And Adrian looked at me and said, what in the world are you? We're on the Dumbo ride. Where <laughs> Responding to these kind of emails is what allowed us to afford to get onto the mm. Dumbo ride. Wow. So, wow. so okay. it's just, it's discernment. And I don't get it right all the time. And, and I will say, I am pretty maniacal about it, but I've learned that you, you have to put up, particularly with the people you work with, some guardrails so you don't have people that are walking on eggshells thinking they have to respond mm. every minute and every... So we have a very clear uh, protocol at the office. Um, you know, if you, if you email me after hours, I'm supposed to get back to you within 24 hours. Mm. Okay whenever I'm doing email, whatever that means. Uh, if you, if you slack me after hours on our, you know, slacks a platform for yeah. your office messaging, uh, that tells me this is, this is time. So I, I need to get back to you today as soon as I have a chance. So if I'm bathing a kid, it can wait till after that, but you know, or sitting down to dinner. If you text me after hours, I need to respond right then. Wow. If you call me after hours, it does not matter why I'm picking up hmm. and we've all had to learn to respect that. You know, that means when we're all binge watching, whatever show is the show of the year, the Ted Lasso or whatever, we can't be on a text string with each other on Sunday night. Cause that kind of blows up the whole, but, but I think that if you can build those rails and we've done it as a company too. If it's a potential new client, someone is going to get back to that person within 60 seconds. That's mm -hmm. just going to happen or we're not doing our job. And, wow. and you can spread that around with people. But um, I think just ask yourself that question, Doug. I'm on a ski lift with my daughter one on one time. Do I need to take this or not? That's so powerful. I love that. I'm thankful for whoever shared that with you. Um, <laughs> Also, I believe when you guys are actually hiring or looking to, to hire someone, you actually put them through a responsiveness test, so to speak. Is that correct? And can you share that uh, with we, uh, we, listeners? Yeah. If you're coming to work here, uh, it usually happens. And now I've told, you know, a hundred podcasts, <laughs> not much of a secret anymore, but it's, it's basically, I mean, we, we particularly our sales, marketing and client facing people, like we, we deal with fairly uh, high stress decisions that organizations are making. Who's our next exec director? Who's our next headmaster? Who, how are we going to clean up the mess from the train wreck that just happened? And we had to fire our leader and now we get, so we're, we are going to be that responsive. And that means when I'm interviewing you, I need to make sure you're cool with that. Um, you know, so if you, if Doug, if you flew here and you interviewed for the day for a position with us, um, 
the way this would roll is we'd probably try and send you home that night. So you're with all your kids and your wife, at least in the morning. And maybe when you land, maybe you, you get a text from somebody you don't know. Like, hey, Doug, this is Jennifer. I work in the office at Vanderblumen. I heard you were there today. I'm out of town today. Sorry. I'd love to catch up with you sometime. That's all. Hmm. That's a part of our interview. Hmm. If you don't respond to Jennifer, you've not lost the job. It's not like you're going to blow it. Just if you respond to her within 24 hours, you're well above average. And there are a lot of studies in the book that will show you that the average response time for nearly anything is about 42 hours. Mm -hmm. So if you're under 24, that's pretty good. You get back to me the next day. If, however, you text me, right, text Jennifer right back. You say, ah, just landed, getting ready to go, tuck the kids in. How about we get some options out there tomorrow? And you've gotten back to Jennifer the same day. Well, that's, that's pretty interesting. That's not normal. And mm -hmm. if you happen to text her back, even in one minute and just say, love Houston, um, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Just anything within a minute. Well, now, now you're the same, you have the same dysfunctional craziness that I have. And that's cool. <laughs> So, cause, cause here's the thing, people, I've, I've just gotten ripped to shreds on the internet for this test. Cause it got picked up by business insider or something or other. And you know, that it, it, man, I, people really don't like this. Um, it's so cruel for you to text people during an interview, you're texting them and I'm not going to get a job. If I don't respond to you, you can just have your job. I'm like, okay, fine. But let me ask you, which is more kind? to ask you to text me back during the interview or to hire you into a job where it's an expectation and it's not how you roll. Wow. That's abusive. Yeah. A good interview shows people what exactly what it's like to work in the organization. And, and so we try and mimic that. And I, I don't know that that speed, that responsiveness is something that a lot of people pick up later in life. I think they're either yeah. that way or not. Now, hmm. You've got a roadmap now. You can become one of those people. But um, yeah. yeah, it's it's. we've had to find, we're kind of a strange group of people and we've had to find ways to make sure we're not hiring someone that's not the same kind of crazy we are. Yeah, but this is so good and so important. You know, it challenged me and, and I try to be good at this and, and always get better. Uh, I actually have, you'll probably appreciate the story. I have a, a donor uh, who, who basically showed me, he keeps a spreadsheet of all the nonprofits that he supports and has all these different columns. And basically he tracks who responds, A, number one, like, do you respond at all? He tracks how quickly they responded. Uh, and again, for him, it's not a matter of a race of who, who responded first, et cetera. The big thing for him is like, is someone responsive? And ultimately, if they're not, you know, that could put their, their giving in jeopardy a year. It's like, hey, you must not really care that I give. And, you know, I share that with our team constantly of like, hey, every one of our donors may not actually keep a spreadsheet of this, but responsiveness matters. And uh, so I just want to say thank you for, for sharing that and for challenging all of us to be better in that area. It's, it's so it's important. It's just the simplest thing in the world. When I was 20, how old was I? 27? senior pastor of a church in Montgomery, they'd called me and they were moving the church, a new location. So they bought land, but we didn't have a building and we were going to be homeless because we'd outgrown the little temporary facility we had. So I'm riding around in the car, going to lunch with a guy who used to be at the church, got frustrated with the way the church, you know, politics and that sort of thing had left. And I'd kind of tried to lure him back because he was a stellar leader and a great human being. And he took me out driving to go look for spots where we might, you know, be able to meet on the weekend. And there's a YMCA just across the road from our new property, about 300 yards down. He said, you know, that YMCA is closed on Sundays. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I, I know the board chair. I could give you his phone number. You could call him. I bet he'd let us meet there. And then we'd be kind of like right across the street. I'm like, cool. So we get back to the office and we're going to sit down to visit a little bit. He gave me the guy's number and then, we made chit chat and he just looked at me and he said, why haven't you called him yet? <laughs> and I'm like, well, Todd, we're sitting here having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now, he, right. Let me tell you one of the best lessons I learned early in my business career. The first chance you have to take care of something is usually going to be the best chance. Wow. Come on. So we called him. 
and we got the facility. Hmm. And I, I, it, that drilled it in me. You get back to people. It, it makes you different. Yeah. Um, I, I am curious, just, you've done 30,000 interviews, placed 3000 leaders. Um, someone may be listening to this and thinking, Maybe they are a unicorn. Where do you see people blow when they're they're seeking out executive positions? Because I'm sure there's people who, who are qualified or do have what it takes. But what advice do you have in the whole interviewing process to really stand out out of all the other applicants yeah. that could be great? Well, I'd focus on these 12 habits because it's going to give you like the roadmap. If you just do these things when you're interfacing with people you're interviewing with, it's going to feel very different to them. It's going to feel like, oh, wow, this one's a winner. And it's going to be backed up. Um, so, you know, my advice would be study these habits. Now, second yeah. piece of advice, bonus content. Um, make sure you do some homework on the company. Mm. Make sure you do some homework yes. on yourself. And then show in that interview. First thing, here's a li this line. This line's worth the whole podcast right here. If you're in an interview, make sure you say this sentence. I am so excited at the chance to interview for this job today. Come on. I, yeah. Just say, yes, 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 yes. People don't say that. And, it's crazy. Yeah. And a lot of the workforce right now is Gen Z and millennials. And I'm a huge fan and believer. But one of the big criticisms is uh, they're apathetic. No, no, we have it. I'm so excited to get to interview for this job today. Now, <clears throat> if you can back it up, here's here it is. Watch this. Let me tell you why I'm excited. You're interviewing me for a marketing position in your new software company that's working with AI. And I think that's pretty amazing. Why do I think it's amazing? Not just because AI is cool, because I work best in these kind of environments. See, you're in a frontier no one's ever been in before and no one really knows what they're doing yet. So you're having to build it as you go and have to face new challenges and learn on the job. And probably everybody in your company probably has this line in their job description that says other duties as necessary. <laughs> yep. You know what I've learned about myself? I flourish in those environments. Come First on. job I had out of college, I had to build an email list. We didn't even know what an email list was. We had to go find, we started with constant contact and we went to Emma and then we started leveraging social media. All of a sudden we have a hundred thousand people on our email list and a click through rate that's unbelievable. And we didn't know how to do that. We just went and figured it out. And I thrived in that. And you list two or three more things that you actually have done that show the type of personality that's needed at that particular company. Now, <sighs> You've shown, oh my gosh, there he studied me and he's interested in me and he's done work that would tell me that he might be able to do that. Wow. And, and cherry on top. Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to share one last Come little on. thing. Come on. You, you can do one more little thing. You just say, and here's the thing, Doug, if this were for a bookkeeper job, I, you would not want to hire me. I'm so bad at doing the same thing every day. I don't get energy from it. I'll do it if I have to. But let me just tell you, that is not where I have flourished. So new challenges, new part. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I love a new thing. But same routine every single day. There are a lot of really smart people that are good at that. I'm not one of them. Now you're authentic. You're self-aware. You're interested in them. You've done your homework. I, it's just, yeah, there you go. Well, you, it's one, I mean, and, and people need to read the book, but basically what you've done in the last three minutes is basically, I think you covered like six of the habits, right? <laughs> and just the way that you communicated, you anticipated, showed that you're a problem solver, you were self-aware. Uh, I don't know if that was, <laughs> you scripted or not, but well done. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I've sat in a few <laughs> interviews. <laughs> um, I guess the last one I would just throw out there as far as interviewing too, you know, one of the, the habits is connected and, you know, I'm curious what your thoughts are on connected. I'm also curious your, your thoughts on how important is someone's platform uh, when it comes to getting executive leadership roles today? Well, I think that depends on um, what industry, I think that depends on what uh, the job is hmm. like, consumer goods right now, there's 16 year olds on TikTok that are more influential than the best ad agency on Madison Avenue. <laughs> True. Because that's consumer goods and it's, should I go buy this pair of shoes or the, 
you know, the Stanley Cup. I mean, is there a better example of platform? <laughs> I mean, that was my granddad's lunchbox company, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, there are some where the platform matters. Here's what I'm realizing, though. The very best leaders don't really lean on that. Mm. It's what happens in the room. And, and it might be that they also have a social media platform, but I think you gotta, you gotta ask yourself as fun and attractive as it might seem to have somebody who's got a YouTube channel with two bajillion views, is it going to help them do the job Hmm, and what are they like in the room? So, you know, it might help you get in the door, but not by much. Um, you know, the flip side to that. Doug is I've got some leaders who refuse to do social media, refuse to do platforms. And, um, while I might not get super impressed cause I'm not seeing them while I'm doom scrolling, I also never see anything that they've posted that they wish they hadn't. Hmm. Oh, come on. Some people yeah. with the biggest platforms often have a pretty <clears throat> significant number of things they'd like removed from their digital footprint. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy what people leave on there. Wild. Yes. Well, William, unfortunately, we're running out of time. And so thank you so much. And if you're listening to this, you know, please go out and buy a copy of the book. We'll include a link in the show notes and all of those things. But as we wrap, I'll just leave this really open-ended. Any other advice you want to leave leaders with today? I, I think it's pretty easy to get discouraged out there. I'm not going to get noticed. There's so many people younger than me in the workforce. They're, you know, I'm old and irrelevant. Or there's so many older people and I can't seem to break through. Or it's just hard to hard to feel like you're noticed or you stand Mm -hmm. out. That's always been the case, but it's even more right now. There are five generations in the workforce right now sharing the same space. First time it's ever happened. And that means it's crowded. And then you throw the noise of social media out there. You throw a sixth generation that we're working with, you know, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen AI is going to change the workforce. Hmm. Skills are going to get less important. Human to human skills are going to get more important. So if you're feeling a little bit like like it's crowded and you can't stand out, this could be the way for you to say, now I know I'm going to stand out and be irreplaceable at work. Wow. Well, thank you so much for all of the nuggets today. Uh, So good. And again, game changing book leader, go out and get it. And uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Doug, thanks so much for having me and thanks for what you're doing. Appreciate you and uh, joy to be with you. Thanks so much. 